Greetings to everyone there at uh, Four Days in May, or virtually Four Days in May. This is Dino Pappas, KL0S, and I'm speaking to you from Williamsburg, Virginia. I was looking forward to uh, making this presentation last year, but COVID-19, of course, got in the way. And uh, I was invited to, uh, to make this pitch uh, virtually, and uh, we'll give it a try, but we really look forward to getting back together again in 2022, hopefully uh, with the Dayton Hamvention in Four Days in May. Uh, test equipment has had a long history of being big, heavy, and expensive. Over the past decade, advances in miniaturization and economies of scale have reduced the size and cost of a slew of instruments to those affordable by many amateur radio operators. The last few years have brought us new and more advanced antenna, spectrum, and vector network analyzers that have exponentially improved the RF measurement capabilities that we have function and RF signal generators, frequency counters, component testers, and many other instruments are now readily available and relatively inexpensive. So let's take a look at how the average ham can assemble and integrate a suite of these inexpensive instruments and create a test bench capable of both maintaining their own stations but a space where serious design and measurement projects can still be undertaken. First, I want to thank Steve Dick, K1RF, for his 2017 presentation describing low-cost test equipment that you can buy on eBay. His ideas mirrored my own, as I have made several similar test equipment presentations at ham clubs and at the Dayton Hamvention. And you can easily find Steve's presentation on the web as well. So, let's get started. It's probably not a surprise to you that the old adage, you get what you pay for, usually applies. But with many of these new inexpensive meters and testers, the bang for the buck you can get uh, can be surprising. Uh, lots of Google searches provide many reviews and feedback on these devices, and at some of the rock bottom prices you sometimes simply can't go wrong. And more importantly, simply because test equipment is reasonably priced does not mean that you can't make useful quality measurements at your bench. Having said that, Sometimes it may be beneficial to go to the other end of the spectrum and follow the axiom, buy nice, not twice. Does your workbench or shop need to resemble a NASA laboratory or a professional engineering lab? Of course not. We all started out small with the test equipment and component stocks that we could assemble and afford. Over time, we gathered additional equipment and junk box material to suit our designing, building, and repairing activities. It's not so much what's on your bench, but rather what you do with it that is important. But before we go on, I'd like to offer a couple of good references you may want to consider. First, the book Build Your Own Electronics Workshop and a second volume, Test Equipment for the Radio Amateur, are great references for general workbench building and outfitting guidance. They are both a few years old, so likely won't cover some of the newer instruments we'll discuss here, but are still great overviews for those putting together their first ham radio workbench or looking for ideas on how to improve their present setup. Don't let pictures of huge masses of test gear scare you off, though. Well, maybe this is what killed off that transistor in the middle of all of that stuff. So, why do we need test equipment to begin with? Sometimes that's not necessarily an easy question to answer, but let me take a swing at it. The reason the FCC allows the amateur service to build and operate our own high-powered radios, assemble a station capable of around the world and through space communications, is to encourage us to be prepared to accomplish our emergency communications mission. Other radio services have operators who simply turn a radio on, operate it in a channelized frequency mode, key and speak into a microphone or type text into a mobile terminal without having to know how the equipment works or is assembled into a complete station, reaching from the power source to radio and data equipment to an antenna and beyond. So amateurs are required to take an exam demonstrating their baseline knowledge to operate and maintain equipment that has the potential to interfere with other government and public safety radio systems. So it takes at least some modicum of test gear to properly maintain and operate 
our equipment so that it, uh, it functions legally, safely, and does not interfere with other amateurs or services. What things do we need to be able to measure? Voltage, current, resistances, polarity, power, impedances, and many more. We also need to be able to characterize and measure different types of signals, including frequencies and harmonics and various forms of modulation. Here are the different types of test equipment we'll discuss. What I'll show you is for each category will be examples of expensive commercial equipment, followed by much less expensive substitute instruments that a typical technically oriented ham might have at his or her workbench. Let's get started with probably the piece of test gear that you'll find most common and most useful on your bench, the digital multimeter or DMM. Here you can see a Rigel six and a half digit multimeter that probably is three digits more than you need for most measurements and it's going to cost you north of 500 bucks. The UNI-T DMM you see here will set you back around $125, but it is a nice instrument to use both at the bench and has the added capability to be used portable away from the workbench. Let me put my first plug in for older test equipment that is both relatively inexpensive and remain valuable tools at the bench. The Heathkit Vacuum Tube Voltmeter, or VTVM, Still uses those funny looking things called tubes, and yes, it is an analog meter, but is useful for a couple of different reasons. It's inexpensive, easy to fix yourself, provides a high impedance input that won't load down the circuit you're intruding into, and the bonus of an analog meter is that it is a much better tool for adjusting circuits where a relative indication of a peak or minimum value can easily be seen. That's really hard to do with a DMM. Although some DMMs try to get around that limitation by displaying a bar graph, but it's still not as good as an analog meter in that regard. A handheld digital multimeter can do double duty, useful both as a bench and a portable instrument. As with the bench style meters, these range in both price and capabilities. The Dave Jones EEV blog series of meters are an excellent value for the things that they can measure. An inexpensive meter is a good tool to keep in your vehicle. Just don't forget to keep track of the batteries to avoid the embarrassing situation of it being out of operation just when you need it. As you can see here, you can find all sorts of really cheap meters. You might say if it's too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true with these meters. But having said that, for that price you almost can't afford not to have one in your car plane or backpack when you attend a ham fest where simple functionality or resistance checks are what's really important. Let's turn our attention to component analyzers, those that can measure and characterize the operation of semiconductors, resistors, capacitors, and others. Some of you may be familiar with them and the Huntron brand of instruments depicted here are expensive. Is there something that can perform the same function for less money? Here's a component analyzer that comes very close to mimicking that of a Huntron, and you may still be able to find one on eHam or eBay or maybe at a local ham fest. I still have this Heathkit component tester that I built many, many moons ago, and it still works well on my workbench. In addition to the old Heathkit, here's a suite of component analyzers I use at my bench from the Peak Company in the United Kingdom. There's a combined capacitor and equivalent series resistance, or ESR meter, which is very helpful when checking large value electrolytic capacitors. A general semiconductor tester that will check the operation of and tell you which lead of a device is which, and one specifically for checking Zener diodes. And then finally, there's a combined LCR meter as well. Here's a combination inductance, capacitance, and resistance meter. You'll see a lot of cheap knockoffs for these units, so buyer beware. On this unit, the tweezer probe allows you to check surface mount devices easily. Finally, there are a slew of really inexpensive component testers, especially at sites like eBay, Banggood, and others. And surprisingly, they do a good job even at ridiculously low prices. 
Okay, let's now take a look at frequency counters for both audio and RF signals. Depending on how much resolution, in other words the number of digits you can observe, and the accuracy you want will determine the type of counter you'll want. Counters depend on the accuracy of their time base, usually some kind of crystal-based source. Better counters, like this HP counter, encase that oscillator in a heated container to maintain the temperature coefficient to keep the crystal at the same frequency and thus the accuracy of the signal you're measuring. Up until about 20 years ago, most hams would calibrate their radios and counters by comparing their time base, usually 10 megahertz, with the signal from the National Bureau of Standards, radio station WWV at Fort Collins, Colorado, or its sister station in Hawaii. Other methods to calibrate counters included matching the frequency observed with the highly accurate color burst signal sent along with over-the-air analog color TV signals that, of course, are no longer available with the changeover to all digital TV signals. Another method of providing an accurate reference involves using GPS disciplined oscillators that were widely used in the cell telephone industry. When those units were made surplus, many hams gladly put them into use at their benches to be able to make highly accurate measurements, often good to one part in 10 to the minus 11th. Those units were then replaced in cell service by rubidium based oscillators that operated independent of any other source. Hams were the glad recipients of these units when they too became available on the surplus market. The unit in the upper left corner is the Z3801A GPS disciplined oscillator. That's the first one that I had on my bench and uh, I still have it there although I don't use it because it uh, requires uh, quite a bit of power to just be on all of the time. You have to leave it on 24-7 for it to be functioning correctly. So I replaced its functionality with what you see on the right hand side. I built a uh, rubidium frequency standard and uh, that one you can leave off until you need it. You flip the switch on and once the red light goes out and the green light comes on telling you that the reference is locked then any piece of test equipment on your bench that you're distributing the 10 megahertz reference out to is ready to make highly accurate uh, measurements. Here's an example of a counter that's still popular. The Heathkit counter has both a temperature compensated crystal time base and the ability to accept an external 10 megahertz reference and will measure up to about 600 megahertz. Uh, I built this unit many many years ago and you can get them at a ham fest for less than a hundred dollars. They're a great unit and uh, although it's rated to only count to 500 megahertz they usually will go up to at least 600. Today on eBay and elsewhere you can find frequency counters for anywhere between $10 and $100. So the Chinese ham BG7TBL has designed a series of inexpensive RF equipment that uh, we'll see in other categories. If only a quick general indication of frequency is required, these portable counters are great to have in addition to a bench unit. Function generators will generate sine, square, and triangle waves, all of which are useful at both uh, audio and radio frequencies. Some are capable of creating many pre-recorded signals ranging from heartbeats to random noise. Others can accept a signal that you design yourself to meet your own requirements. The Rigol generator shown here can generate sine waves up to 160 MHz and square and triangle waves at lower frequencies. A key difference between a function generator providing an RF signal and a dedicated RF signal generator unit is that the levels available may not be low enough for receiver testing, but you can always use an external attenuator to drop those signals down low enough to be useful in that role. Here's an example of an inexpensive function generator and you can see that as the price goes down there's a corresponding lowering of the highest frequency that can be generated. Even less expensive units are available, and again the frequency range goes down, but they can still be useful for audio and slow speed digital signals. Here's an example from uh, eBay for less than $6. Um, quality? Eh, I don't know, but if you just need a basic signal to uh, provide a, a frequency out in the field, for example, somewhere just testing something simply, these uh, can be uh, very useful as well. 
Now, dedicated RF signal generators are really useful for all sorts of radio equipment testing and repair. This unit from Rigel can generate signals up to 3 GHz with a corresponding price. Again, we can see now very capable RF signal generators at attractive prices. As we said, some of these units, especially the one from BG7TBL, can accept a 10 MHz external time base. But don't forget older analog style RF generators that, although they can't accept external references, are perfectly suited for boat anchor radio and equipment work where tight frequency and level tolerances really aren't required. The ability to measure power is another important function to keep our stations functioning properly. Low power measurements are important as well in design and repair of circuits well before a transmitter's final amplifier stage and deep inside a receiver's chain of oscillators, amplifiers, and mixers. High-priced power meters usually require a dedicated cable that attaches to different sensors that are power and frequency dependent. Even older surplus HP power meters can be had for $100 or less, but the cost of the required cable and sensor can often be 5 to 10 times that price. Here's an example of an inexpensive combination power meter and dummy load that is good to above 2 GHz and it's hard to believe that it will actually dissipate 50 watts of power. Surprisingly it actually will, but just don't keep that kind of power applied too long. Again this inexpensive unit is actually pretty versatile as my unit will measure all the way up to 2.6 GHz and as low as 1 kilohertz, and will accept any power from 0.1 watts to 50 watts. And yes, again, that surprised me too. Here's an even cheaper example of a PCB-based circuit you can get on eBay that will measure RF signals from minus 75 dBm to plus 16 dBm, and from 1 to 600 megahertz, and some units even greater. I built the power measuring circuit into my own enclosure. It will translate RF signal levels to a DC voltage and you can see from the graph that in between minus 74 dBm and plus 18 dBm the response is very linear and that linear DC voltage you can measure and then correlate to its appropriate power value. Not bad for about 20 bucks. Let's turn our attention now to oscilloscopes. Besides the digital multimeter, the oscilloscope is one of the handiest tools you can have at the bench. The scope is virtually a TV set that lets you examine signals throughout your shack. Analog scopes like this venerable Tektronix 465 are popular and even though they're getting long in the tooth, if you don't abuse it, you can expect it to be a good unit. Analog scopes lack the modern features of automatic measurements and others, but that's a small price to pay for a small price. Surprisingly, an analog scope in some cases can display a signal better than a modern digital scope. As scopes matured, the digital age brought more measurement capabilities to the table. This Tech 2440 scope, although still using a CRT display, allows you to take a digital snapshot of signals that you can then make further measurements of. By the way, tech scopes of this vintage often had a signal available at the rear panel, which is an amplified representation of one of the input channels. This allows you to attach a counter, for example, and measure the frequency of the signal that your counter would not necessarily have the sensitivity to measure directly. Fast forward now to the miracle of digital-based inexpensive scopes. The Rigol scope you see here has four separate channels and a 50 MHz bandwidth. You should know that this bandwidth frequency specification relates to the point where the scope's response is reduced by 3 dB. That means your scope may in fact suitably measure signals above that frequency. And if all you're looking for is the shape or quality of the signal that the reduced display will give you is still useful. The math functions, including the fast Fourier transform, allow you to use many of these new scopes to function as a basic spectrum analyzer as well. 
And today we're finding more and more computer-driven test equipment that remove the need for the box to provide the unit's display. This makes them much more portable and allows you to use complex computer software to perform a multitude of measurements, reducing the need for those capabilities to be built into the scope's hardware. Of course, there are less expensive units. The mini oscilloscope you see here puts a decent portable scope in your shirt pocket ready for use anywhere. There are even units at the $25 level, but they're very limited. If all you're measuring is a low audio frequency or very slow digital signal, it may very well be sufficient. Spectrum analyzers are tools that engineers and technicians drooled over back in the day. Unlike the oscilloscope that operates in the time domain, spectrum analyzers display frequency versus amplitude. And even back then, many companies even limited those who could actually put their hands on those uh, instruments and use them. Several manufacturers compete in this arena, and here you see a Roden Schwartz high end unit. But don't get discouraged by the cost just yet. And it wasn't long ago that consumer grade and priced spectrum analyzers came onto the scene. Here's a Rigel analyzer that will measure signals up to 1.5 gigahertz and also has a built-in tracking generator that's useful for testing filters and even tuning your repeater's duplexer system. Look to spend about a kilobuck for one of these, but I'm sure that you won't regret it. I didn't. In just the past couple of years, another leap has been made reducing the price of basic units like the tiny spectrum analyzer shown here. For about $60, you can have a shirt pocket size analyzer that will display signals up to almost 1 gigahertz. Although the tiny SA may not have the measurement speed or dynamic range of the kilobuck boxes, it's still a great basic instrument and can make good measurements. We'll also see the tiny SA's cousin in the realm of vector network analyzers. You're probably familiar with the large number of software defined radios or SDR. Many inexpensive SDR dongles can be used with software to view and provide at least relative signal comparisons. There are also several new SDR receivers that include a built-in display, as you see here with the Russian design Malahit Portable. In a pinch, these receivers can function as a limited spectrum analyzer and are great for hunting unwanted RF noise sources like power line noise. Wes Hayward, W7ZOI, and Terry White, K7TAU, described a homebrew spectrum analyzer way back in the August 1998 issue of QST. Like other units of the time period, their analyzer used an oscilloscope working in the XY mode to display the spectrum. Still a viable option for those who enjoy rolling their own. Like their cousin, the spectrum analyzer, the Vector Network Analyzer, or VNA, has been a way too expensive piece of equipment for us up until just recently. Even surplus units still bring top dollar. VNAs can provide both scalar and phase information across a device under test. The dam began to break several years ago with the introduction of Tom Bayer's DG8 SAQ's VNWA, now in its third iteration. Others in this category still bring a cost in the $400 to $500 range, and they are quality instruments and enjoy large followings. But the world moves on, and a Chinese ham was one of the first to design and market the Nano VNA that is now also in several variants. Costing only about $60, the unit provides several functions, including standing wave ratio, Smith charts, return loss, and two port measurements. These shirt pocket size antenna and more analyzers are great instruments as long as you understand the limitations they operate under. For the average ham, these limitations really are not significant. Although the Nano VNA and the Tiny SA are available from a wide variety of sellers across the spectrum, no pun intended, we've found here in our club that R&L Electronics have them both at a lower cost and provide great customer service that you may not find with other sellers. We shouldn't discount our ability to roll our own basic test equipment. We may not do the original design, but there are many project articles available to replicate. 
Here are some that I've built over the years that are nice to have when a specialized need comes along. The one in the upper right hand corner is a crystal tester, a small RF generator directly below it that'll go from uh, 3.4 to 31 megahertz, and a RF phase meter on the left that uh, is useful as well. And here is just a small list of suppliers, many of which you're probably already familiar with, who market inexpensive test gear and components. Okay, that was a real whirlwind tour of inexpensive test equipment that you can use to outfit your own RF test bench. There are many more, including power supplies, electronic loads, digital logic testers, and others. I would like to put in a recommendation for organizing the more technically minded members of your local club into a builder's group. Many clubs have them, but they're not just for the experienced ham. They should be the breeding ground for future technically oriented hams, both male and female. Our club has several YLs who jump right in and warm up their own soldering irons. It's been a real treat to be able to share this time with you today. I really appreciate the invitation and hopefully this has been of some use to you. And uh, now I'm prepared for any of your questions. Thanks for your attention.